to our week. So we'll begin by welcoming Father Nicholas this evening. Thank you once again for um, sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I know the popes are something that you are very interested in. Um, now, I'm not going to go through Father's biography. We do that every time. And, and um, you uh, you all know of old his love of history and where it stems from and his dad and the archivists and everything else. But it, there has been a slight development and I'm sure he's not going to tell you. So I certainly shall. Um, he has been asked by the diocese whether he would uh, lecture for 12 Monday afternoons a year at the seminary in Allen Hall. So I'm delighted to say that he is now part of the faculty of St Mary's Strawberry Hill as well. So absolutely delighted. That's my old college. So I'm really <laughs> proud. So um, I think they're getting a very good uh, deal out of you, Father Nicholas, because I think you'll do very well. It's, it's modern church history which tell us the years of that again it's uh, basically from the french revolution until the second vatican council so from the 1780s until the 1960s so the the really kind of well the period when uh, so much changed and uh, yeah a very very interesting period well that's gonna be really interesting so i think that starts in january doesn't it so mm. father nicholas from all of us here we'd like to welcome you and <laughs> um you may begin Thank you, Angela, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. Um, I realise I'm competing with both very good weather and the beginning of the football. Um, and in fact, I'm going to probably watch the second half of the game this evening after this. Um, Italy versus Turkey. So it's appropriate we have an Italian subject this evening, a history of the papacy. Now, I'm not going to be looking at the theology of the papacy so much. And I'm not really going to be looking very much at the two gentlemen on the screen, Pope Francis and Pope Emeritus Benedict, um, partly because they're still living so that it's not really the historical bit of the papacy. Um, and also to say stuff about them, we'd, we'd enter into lots of kind of uh, church politics and, and, and things which have, are still very much live. So I'm going to be looking at the history of the papacy, a whistle stop tour of 2000 years and 260 popes. You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to be looking at every single pope um, by name. I'm just going to be looking at the, the key characters and some of the key developments over that time. And of course, the place where we're going to begin is not Rome, but Caesarea Philippi, that village in what is now Israel. We all know the story. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, where he would be put to death. And he asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter made that simple but sublime confession of faith. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And in doing so, he was doing a bit of a wordplay, which is completely lost in the English language. But um, the word Peter, Petrus, means rock. So he was kind of playing around with what his name meant. Peter, the simple fisherman from Galilee, far from perfect, so often putting his foot right into it, was chosen as the leader of the apostles, the visible head of the infant church. And there are many signs in the Gospels that Peter was given a certain prominence over the others. He's always named first in any list of the twelve. Uh, on several occasions, he speaks on their behalf and he was the first to enter the empty tomb. You remember that he and John were running to the tomb. They were so excited about this news that Jesus had risen. But even though John, John was younger and fitter and he got to the tomb first, he let Peter as the kind of elder, as the head of the apostles, enter the tomb first. And also in the Acts of the Apostles, there are several details of Peter's leadership various speeches and miracles, his dealing with various disputes, and they have that first church council, the Council of Jerusalem, which was a much simpler affair than the Second Vatican Council, but Peter there um, presided over that gathering. Now, an early tradition says that Peter, um, before going to Rome, he actually went to Antioch and he was bishop there. Um, so his primacy wasn't just exercised in Rome, it was exercised in Jerusalem first, then in Antioch, where he was a bishop, a leader, and then finally he settled in Rome. And of course, St. Peter and St. Paul are often seen as these, these twin 
leaders in the early Roman church, almost a Christian version of Romulus and Remus, the mythical founders of Rome. But Peter is the one who is seen um, as having that leadership, that primacy. The first successors of St. Peter are largely obscure figures. Uh, most of them are honored as saints. In fact, almost all the popes of the first few centuries are regarded as saints. Um, and five of them appear in the first Eucharistic prayer. So you can really impress your friends by knowing the names of the first few popes. The first one is Peter. And then we have Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus and Cornelius, all of whom are named in the first Eucharistic prayer. Um, Sixtus, of course, his name means the sixth one. He's the sixth pope after um, St. Peter. Now, of course, at this stage, the papacy had not developed all the bureaucratic structures of later centuries. So there's no uh, Vatican. There's no St. Peter's Basilica. There are no departments. Um, there are no monsignors fluttering in the background. It's pretty simple. Um, in fact, Peter, I imagine, moved his address a number of times in Rome and the early popes lived in in simple houses. As one historian put it, the Roman primacy was felt rather than defined, experienced rather than conceptualized. But there's evidence that early Christians did recognize the Bishop of Rome as having some sort of authority. So Saint Clement, who was Pope at the end of the first century, so he was died in about 101, he wrote a famous letter to the church in Corinth, um, which is the first surviving example of the Pope intervening in affairs beyond Rome. And obviously St. Clement felt that he was able to do so. He had some sort of leadership um, over other churches. St. Ignatius uh, spoke a few years later of the Church of Rome presiding over the other churches. And another early church father, St. Irenaeus, wrote at the end of the second century that with the Roman church, because of its superior origin, all the churches must agree, that is, all the faithful in the whole world, and it is in her that the faithful everywhere have maintained the apostolic tradition. So we don't have many documents really from this period, but there are some glimpses that the Bishop of Rome was considered as a glue that bound the church together, a first amongst equals. Together with the rest of the Christian community, the first popes belonged to a religion that was persecuted, um, although this tended to be rather sporadic and often local in character. It depended on what else was going on in the Roman Empire and who the emperor was. In fact, yesterday, Angela and I went to the fantastic Nero exhibition in the British Museum. And of course, Nero is considered one of the really bad guys in the Roman Empire, because after the, uh, the city of Rome burnt down, he blamed the Christians and many Christians were put to death. And that was one particularly violent um, time of persecution, but there were also times of peace and relative toleration as well. Several of the popes are honoured as martyrs. Perhaps the most famous one is Saint Clement, who we've already mentioned. He was exiled to the Crimea and he was thrown into the sea with a heavy anchor tied around his neck. And you can see him in art, normally with a massive anchor that he's holding. But despite all the persecution, the popes in these early centuries did a lot to organise the church and address theological issues and especially issues that were being debated. But then eventually the status of Christians uh, dramatically improved at the start of the fourth century. And we have the first um, Christian emperor, the emperor Constantine, who was actually baptised on his deathbed, but he had an encounter he believed with the Christian God on the battlefield in 312 and this led him to show favour and toleration to the Christians and so he allowed the building of churches including a church over St Peter's tomb on the Vatican Hill um, and he also built the first Lateran Basilica which is very much the cathedral of the popes and is where many of the popes also lived. So suddenly the Christians come out from the catacombs. Constantine's conversion had some very important long-term consequences. We often forget that Constantine moved his capital from Rome to Constantinople, which was named after him. Um, 
and he saw that as very much the new Rome, a more splendid version of the old Rome. It became a rival centre of power. Um, and in fact, there were lots of disagreements between the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, and the Bishop in Constantinople, who was known as the Patriarch. But one of the key things that happened is that because the Emperor had moved away, Rome really became the city of the Popes. The Popes were allowed to have a certain um, dominance over the place. And you get charismatic leaders like Saint Leo the Great, uh, who was Pope in the fifth century, he really raised the prestige of the papacy. He was a, a well-known leader and theologian. Um, he produced a statement of the church's belief that our Lord was one person, but with two distinct natures, human and divine. Um, and when this was accepted by a church council at Chalcedon, the bishops declared, this is the faith of the apostle Peter. Peter has spoken through the voice of Leo. Um, he also defended the city of Rome from external threats. He even persuaded Attila the Hun from plundering Rome in 452 um, and uh, very much saved the city on that occasion. So Rome becomes the city of the popes and you have some really outstanding individuals like Saint Leo the Great that shows that this um, leadership really does mean something. The conversion of the emperor also added a new dimension to uh, church history, that rather vexed relationship between the church and the state. And in fact, yesterday, when Angela and I went to the British Museum, we also went to the fantastic exhibition about Thomas Beckett, which I really recommend to you. And that's that's obviously many years later, but that's also all about that, that, that relationship, that division, that, that struggle often between the church and the state, between a pope or a bishop and a king or emperor. So this is something we see throughout church history, this, this tension between church and state. The Roman Empire eventually collapses, as we all know, and there's a huge power vacuum in its place. And it's filled by lots of exotic sounding peoples like the Lombards and the Ostrogoths. What remains of the old Roman Empire continued in the east as the Byzantine Empire, um, to which the popes remain nominally loyal until the 8th century. And in fact, we can see this close link with the East, with Byzantium, in some of the um, things that you found at the papal court until quite recently. Um, up until the 1960s, the Pope, for grand occasions, was carried on this portable throne that you can see in this picture from the 1950s. It was called the Sedia gestatoria and that was something that was borrowed from the court in Constantinople from the Byzantine emperors it was a real sign of of majesty and authority and likewise on it on either side of the pope right up until the 1960s people carried these fans of ostrich feathers known as flabella uh, and again that was something that came from Byzantium from from the east so that very early connection when the pope had a, had a very strong relationship with the Byzantine Emperor before the great division between the East and the West. Um, you could see that in some of the trappings of the papal court. One of the most famous emperors from this period is Saint Gregory the Great, who is sometimes called the Apostle of England. Um, he was the first monk to become Pope uh, and he had formerly been involved uh, in the diplomatic service and he had lived in Constantinople once again reminding us of that very close link with the place. He referred to himself as the servant of the servants of God and of course he is remembered for sending monks to Kent to southern England to convert the king um, and that's why Canterbury uh, became the centre of church power in this country because that's where his monks established a cathedral. Um, so we remember him very fondly, but he's also a, a, th a great theologian and a doctor of the church um, and one of these outstanding popes that we find in our history. The popes were also beginning to look a bit nearer to home for their political support. They weren't just worried about the Byzantine emperor. Um, in the 8th century, France was becoming and Central Europe was becoming more and more powerful. Um, and in 754, there was a very important meeting that took place between the Pope and the King of the Franks, who was called Pepin the Short. Um, and one thing that the King offered 
uh, to the Pope was a big bit of territory in the center of Italy. Um, and this became what was known as the Papal States. So from the 750s right up until the late 19th century, the Pope wasn't just a spiritual leader. He wasn't just um, the head of the Catholic Church. He was also an Italian monarch. He had his own kingdom in the center of Italy. And on the map on the screen, you can see um, the Papal States at its largest extent. So it went all the way from uh, Ravenna and Bologna in the north, um, and of course, including Assisi, Ancona, the great port on the Adriatic, right down to Rome and, and almost going towards Naples. So the Pope wasn't just a bishop, he was also uh, a leader, a, a king. He had his own kingdom and the affairs of his kingdom began to sort of dominate rather. Um, you know, he was worried about all the things that leaders worry about, like taxation and, and defending his borders and, and protecting his power. So in many ways, it perhaps wasn't a very positive uh, development. Shortly afterwards, um, Pepin's son Charlemagne uh, is crowned emperor by the Pope in St. Peter's. Um, so again, it shows that close connection between the church and the state, which sometimes worked in the Pope's favor, but also could cause quite a lot of tension. Um, as one historian put, put it, in creating an emperor, which the Pope did by crowning Charlemagne, the Pope created not a deputy or an ally, but actually a rival, or even in some cases, a master. Um, so th th that's a very strong element to our, our story. Now, the title of the talk is The Good, the Bad and the Holy. And that implies that there have been bad popes, and there certainly have been bad popes. At the end of the first millennium, the papacy entered a period of decline and corruption, partly because it was so closely tied to that kingdom in central Italy, and the papacy became a kind of plaything of the most powerful Roman families. Um, many of the popes of the period met violent and suspicious deaths. So we're not talking martyrdoms here, we're talking assassinations. So Pope John VIII was first poisoned by his entourage and then beaten to death. Pope John X was suffocated by a pillow. Pope Stephen VIII was brutally mutilated. Pope Formosus, who you can see in the picture, he actually managed to die naturally in his bed, but nine months later, his body was exhumed and put on a show trial in Rome, dressed as Pope in his vestments. Um, it must have been a really hideous and rather smelly sight. He'd been accused of perjury and violating the laws forbidding the translation of the moving of bishops. Um, and as a result, the fingers he used for blessing were cut off and his corpse was thrown into the river Tiber. Of course, his real crime was he belonged to the, the wrong faction at the time and, and, and the Pope kind of was trying to punish his, his enemies. But it just shows what a rather, um, well, not a very edifying state the papacy um, had got to. The papacy during this period has even been described as a pornocracy. In other words, ruled by prostitutes because there were certain very strong um, individuals who were mistresses to popes and who um, were really the power behind the throne, um, especially certain women called Theodora and her daughter Marozia. And these powerful women contributed to the myth, which you might have heard, the myth of Pope Joan, the story that a woman, some say an English woman, disguised herself as a man and worked her way up the Roman Curia, eventually being elected Pope. Um, her daring scheme was only discovered when she became pregnant and gave birth during a procession. Um, now, the legend was widely believed, but um, there really is no evidence for it. But again, it just shows the kind of moral state of the papacy at the time. The bad popes of this period, despite everything, were still regarded as successors of Peter and um, had a certain dignity in their office, if not in their person. And despite everything, they did manage to hold fast to the faith and assert their authority. And even a scandalous pope like John XII promoted monastic reform um, and supported great pastors like St. Dunstan of Canterbury. So, you know, despite their, their legend, their black legend, they, 
they also did some kind of more positive things as well. So after this period of bad popes, um, and as the second millennium dawns, so this is the time of William the Conqueror and the Norman Conquest, things get a bit better. Uh, there's a growing movement for church reform. Something needs to happen. Um, we can't have these bad popes going on forever. We need to change. Um, so there's a succession of reformist popes, um, and the most famous one is Saint Gregory the Seventh, sometimes known by his pre-papal election name of Hildebrand. Um, and he really asserted the authority of the Pope. He actually said that um, the Pope was above emperors and kings and that everyone owed him loyalty and obedience. The papacy grew in confidence. This was the age of popes calling crusades to the Holy Land, of getting together all the church laws and, and codifying them and developing also all the departments in the Vatican, all, all the kind of bureaucracy. So it's getting bigger and bigger. Historians have spoken of the emergence of a papal monarchy, something much more organized. Um, and perhaps one of the high points came with the reign of Innocent III, who was a Roman lawyer, um, only 38 when he was elected, but he combined genuine holiness with a sharp intellect and understanding of human affairs and, and leadership. Um, and he not only claimed supreme authority, he certainly seemed to have managed to exercise it over many of the kings of the time. But then we kind of enter another slightly confusing period. Um, Italy, or what we now call Italy, is a very turbulent place. Um, and there's lots of battles between the different families and different factions. And so the popes decide to leave Rome and they move to somewhere a bit safer. And they choose to go to the town of Avignon in uh, the south of France in Provence, um, beautiful place, which I've been to a few times. You know, all those pictures of lavender fields with beautiful French churches, the Avignons in, in, in that area. Um, so this is the 14th century and the popes leave Rome and they move to what is now France. Um, the reason they chose Avignon was because uh, it had good communication links with uh, most of Europe and it was safe. It was far away from all these warring families. The popes built a fortified palace there, which you can still see, and they used a lovely summer residence at a place called Chateau Neuf de Pape, which literally means the Pope's new castle. And of course, now it's famous as a center of wine production. And it's one of my favorite wines, actually, Chateau Neuf de Pape. During the period, um, the papacy became quite French. Um, in fact, all the popes at this period were French and most of the cardinals they, cre they created were French as well. Some of them were quite strong leaders, um, and it, in some ways it was quite a good time, although obviously that connection with Rome had been lost. Eventually they decided to go back to Rome, and the Pope who did that was Gregory the Eleventh, and he died shortly afterwards, but at the election after his death, um, there was a, a, a big division, um, and as a result, to cut a long story short, there were two popes. So one pope was elected, he was rejected by half the cardinals, they elected another pope instead, so you've got two people claiming to be pope. And this is sometimes referred to as the Great Schism, and this split Europe in half. You've got some countries following one pope, some countries following um, another one. And at one stage the cardinals get a really good idea, let's have a church council to sort out the mess. So the church council elected its own pope, so now there were three popes, um, which just made it even more confusing. Eventually, the situation um, calmed down and they were able to settle on one pope. But again, this is the 15th century. It's not a particular high point in the history um, of the popes. We now come to the Renaissance. So the popes are back in Rome. There's only one pope again. Um, and the popes begin to reassert their authority. Rome had been rather neglected in the time of the Avignon Pope. So it's a time of lots of building. Um, and it's a time of the Popes becoming great artistic patrons. So um, you've got people like Raphael and Michelangelo around who the Popes um, commission, perhaps most famously, you, things like the Sistine Chapel, uh, which I'm sure many of you have seen. The Renaissance Popes are sometimes dismissed as being rather extravagant and immoral. 
certainly the most infamous of them is Alexander VI, who was a, um, a the Borgia Pope. He belonged to the originally a Spanish family called the Borgias. Um, and everyone, the thing everyone knows about him is that he fathered at least nine illegitimate children. Um, and he openly kept a mistress even after his election. I think most of those children were born before he was elected Pope, but, you know, not particularly um, edifying. He gave wealth and titles to his family. He created a, a duchess for his sons out of papal land. He arranged good marriages for his daughter, the very famous Lucrezia Borgia. And of course, the name of Borgia is closely associated with rumours of poisons and banquets. Now, there is some truth in all this, of course, but um, the black legend of the Borgia popes originated largely with their enemies, and especially Alexander VI's successor, Julius II. Um, and if you do look at history and if you look at the sources, although Alexander wasn't a saint by any means, he actually took his leadership of the church quite seriously. Um, he showed an interest in reform. He welcomed pilgrims to Rome for the holy year of 1500. And he also tried to unite Christendom in a crusade against the Turks, which is something the popes um, have done from time to time. It's rather appropriate because tonight there's a big football match between Italy and Turkey. Um, and I'm sure people uh, will remember that some of the popes in Rome have called crusades um, to fight the Turks. So it's good that we can now be a bit more friendly and have a, um, a football match together. So it's a time of splendor. There's still a bit of corruption. Um, people, popes are giving wealth to their family, um, but it's another very uh, interesting period in our papal history. And then of course, we come to the time of the Protestant Reformation just a few decades later. Um, the popes originally don't take the Reformation very seriously. They think Luther is just a German monk who, you know, is causing lots of fuss and is not really worth their attention. In fact, the Pope is trying to mount another crusade against the Turks who had um, come into Eastern Europe and were, um, had taken places like Belgrade. Uh, so the Popes were, more, con were more, more, more concerned with that threat. But calls for reform in the church were not only found uh, in the likes of Luther and Calvin, there were also strong calls for reform within the Catholic Church as well. And this is the time of lots of new orders like the Jesuits, who were founded in 1540 um, and lots of local initiatives and synods. But eventually the Pope decides to call a general council of the church, the Council of Trent, which meets between 1545 and 1563. Um, one of the reasons it was so long is because of all the politics involved and getting you know, protection from, um, from the political leaders. But during this council, the church comes up with an agenda of reform. So for example, um, bishops are ordered to be resident in their diocese because some bishops never even visited their diocese. They kind of lived a, a luxurious life at court and they never actually attended to their people. Um, seminaries were founded for the education of priests because up until then, there was no such thing as a training college for priests. Um, they normally either went to a, one of the great universities or uh, a cathedral school or they kind of learnt on the job by being a sort of apprentice. Um, there was there a new um, emphasis on preaching and catechesis. It's the time when the first catechism is printed so that people could be educated in the faith. Um, and also the way that we worship God, the liturgy, that was also simplified and standardised um, and, and made a, a bit more um, universal. So it's a really important period in our church history. And the word Tridentine comes from the Council of Trent. You might hear of the Tridentine Mass or the Tridentine Reforms. This is where it comes from. For the next few centuries, really, the great task of the papacy was to apply the decrees of Trent to make them concrete, to make them actually happen all around the world. And perhaps the most famous of the Tridentine popes was Saint Pius V, um, who was a Dominican friar, and he decided to wear white because that's the color the Dominicans wear. And from that moment onwards, the Pope always wore a white cassock. He also is famous, by the way, for excommunicating Elizabeth I of England, which caused a, a few uh, issues for Catholics in this country. 
In the 17th and 18th centuries, the popes had to contend with the power of lots of strong monarchs like Louis XIV in France. Um, and also the political power of the papacy was, was weakened. Um, in fact, in uh, 1773, the Pope found himself suppressing the Jesuits, one of its closest allies, due to political pressure. The Popes of this period were generally speaking pious and well-intentioned, often rather old and you know not very energetic. One of my favorites though was uh, this one, Ed, uh, Benedict XIV. Uh, he was very intelligent uh, and energetic and also a great wit. He was actually great at cracking jokes and it's quite entertaining reading his biography. He liked to walk around Rome in his wig and his tricorn hat, um, whereas many of his predecessors would only be seen a few times a year. Um, and he was admired not only by Catholics, but even by Voltaire, who was a, a great enlightened philosopher, um, and even by the Sultan um, himself. So he was able to break beyond um, the, the, the Catholic world and, and be admired by others. The last um, 18th century Pope was Pius VI, who we see uh, on the screen. Um, to some extent, he lived the life a bit like a Renaissance Pope. Um, you know, he, he was all into commissioning art and he, he gave power to some extent to his family, but he was also aware that things were changing and that there were quite a few dangers facing him. Um, and it was his unlucky lot to deal with the fallout of the French Revolution. Um, in fact, the French, as you know, they're not content just to um, change things in France. They bring the whole of Europe into war. And in 1798, the French reach Italy and they reach Rome and they take the Pope prisoner. So, again, it's this, this ongoing tension between the church and the state, between popes and kings and, and political leaders. Um, the Pope is taken to uh, France and he dies in prison. Uh, in 1799. And some people actually think that this could be the end of the papacy. You know, uh, the French Revolution is finishing so much, it briefly finishes the French monarchy. The Doge in Venice becomes extinct. Perhaps the, the papacy will also become extinct. But the cardinals meet in Venice under Austrian protection to elect a new pope who is Pius um, VII, who you can see on the, on the right hand side. Uh, and he also has lots of issues with the French, especially with Napoleon. Um, Napoleon sort of supports the church a bit more than the, the, the kind of the French Revolution. Um, there's a concordat, an agreement arranged, and the Pope goes to Paris to crown a Napoleon as emperor. Um, but also the Pope himself eventually is imprisoned by Napoleon um, for a number of years. And again, it just shows the vulnerability of the papacy at this time. In 1814, Pius VII is released and he makes a triumphant progress back to Rome and he enters the city on the 24th of May that year, which ever since has been uh, celebrated as the Feast of Our Lady, Help of Christians, because Mary's intercession was, was, was seen as absolutely vital in the release of the Pope. So the popes are restored to Rome after this period of, of um, revolution and imprisonment. And once again, the popes assert their authority. They realize they're living in a world of revolution, of liberalism, um, of kind of secret societies. And they're trying to refocus people back to the traditional values. Perhaps the greatest figure of the 19th century um, Catholic Church is Pope Pius IX. Uh, the Italian word for ninth is nonno, so he, he was known as uh, Pio Nonno, um, although some English wits called him Pius Nono, Pi Pio no Nono, because he was always saying no to kind of liberal things and, and, and re the revolutionary ideals that England rather liked. Uh, but he is a very strong leader, um, has quite an attractive personality, um, real kind of charming with, with, with pilgrims who meet him. Um, but he faces lots of uh, battles and one of the biggest battles he has to face is the growing uh, Italian nationalism. You know, Italy in the early 19th century is made up of lots of different kingdoms and duchies, uh, including the Papal States. And there's a growing movement for 
uh, Italians to take pride in their nationality, to get rid of any foreigners who are controlling parts of Italy, especially the Austrians who control some of the north of Italy. Um, and they eventually realized that the Papal States is a bit of a block and, and really the Papal States needs to uh, disappear so that this new kingdom of Italy can be formed. Um, so the Pope comes under attack, not just as a spiritual leader, but as a king, as a, as a temporal leader. Uh, and by 1860, to cut a long story short, the Pope lost all his possessions except Rome and the immediate area around Rome. Um, he has the protection from France for a, a period and he's able to, to kind of hang on to that remnant of his kingdom. But when France and Germany have a war in 1870, the French go home, the Italians invade Rome and Rome no longer become is the papal city. Rome is the capital of the new kingdom of Italy. One of the positives, though, of this is that Pius IX loses his authority, his, his power as a king which he saw as an absolute disaster, but he is able to focus on his spiritual authority. And it's really under Pius IX that the modern papacy is formed. You know, the, the, the papacy that is admired across the world, you know, he he's becomes a global figure. Um, this is partly because of new things like photography and cheaper newspapers and cheaper travel, meaning that more and more pilgrims can actually visit Rome and when they go to Rome, they can actually see the Pope. Uh, so the Pope becomes a bit of a celebrity. He becomes a global figure. Um, and he's also seen to some extent as a living martyr because he's had a lot of battles he's had to fight. To, to fight. And it was only recently that the Popes were imprisoned by the French. And even one of them, as we saw, died in, in exile as the prisoner. So um, people see him as a, as a living saint, a living martyr. Another thing that happens under Pius IX is the First Vatican Council, which uh, defines the papal infallibility. Um, I guess you probably all know basically what that is. It is basically saying that the Holy Spirit uh, protects the Pope from error when he makes a solemn statement as Bishop of Rome, supported by all the, the universal church, by all the bishops, and he makes some really important statements on faith and morals. It's something that happens very, very occasionally. Um, but when those times do happen, this doctrine says that the Pope has a certain protection, if you like, from the Holy Spirit, just as we all have to some extent, you know, when, when we're um, doing the work of faith and when we're, we're, we're teaching the faith, you know, the Holy Spirit is in us. Well, the Holy Spirit in a very special way is with the Pope when he makes these um, solemn declarations. So it's, it's a way of affirming his uh, God-given authority. We now move into the modern period, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, Leo XIII, he's the successor to Pius IX. Um, another very attractive personality, great lover of philosophy. Um, and also he writes the first document, papal document about Catholic social teaching, about the rights of workers. Um, about the dignity of work, about the, the, the need for a, a just wage, all these things that are becoming more of an issue because of the Industrial Revolution, because of all the immense changes in society in the 19th century. He's also the first pope to be filmed and the first pope to have his voice recorded. And a bit later, I might try and play you that recording because I found it on YouTube. I mean, it, and it's really quite amazing because Leo XIII was born in 1810 so in the time of Napoleon, so it's amazing to see footage of this man and to, and to hear his voice. His successor is uh, somebody that you probably remember from your childhood because he was very, very popular in the kind of um, sort of 40, 50 years ago, St. Pius X. Uh, he was one of the few parish priests to become Pope um, because normally if you become a bishop, especially traditionally, you've kind of been in other jobs, you haven't really got your hands dirty in a parish, but he was a parish priest. He was in fact the son of a village postman, um, but he eventually became a bishop and he became Pope. And he encouraged uh, liturgy. He is the person who introduced frequent communion because there was a long time in the church's history when 
people didn't receive communion very regularly, certainly not every time they went to mass, but he said, no, it's good when you go to mass to receive communion. And he also encouraged um, the whole thing of first holy communions. And that really dates from his pontificate, children of the age of seven receiving their first communion. Probably the most controversial of the modern popes is Pius XII, um, who some of you may remember, Pope between uh, 1939 and 1958. During his lifetime, he was widely respected as a saint, as a shepherd of souls. He defined the assumption of Our Lady as a Catholic dogma, wrote lots of beautiful um, encyclicals, letters, very much aware of new forms of media. He, he, he used the television and the radio extensively. Um, and he was a well-known figure all over the world. But since his death, um, there have been lots of books about his silence in the face of the Holocaust and people saying, well, really, Pius XII as Pope um, could have done more. And perhaps was he slightly on the side of the Germans? This is, this is what they're um, suggesting. I think it's true to say that Pius was a highly experienced diplomat who realized the nature of international politics and he realized the very delicate position um, of the church and his policy during the second world war was all about the neutrality of the church so not taking sides um, no matter what was happening um, and if you're neutral then that gives you a certain freedom to help uh, victims of war and to campaign for peace people still say though that the pope could have done more um, and certainly on paper i think he could have taken a more aggressive and open policy. But one of the big questions is how effective would it have been if, if he had actually spoken out um, attacking Hitler? What would that have achieved? Um, after all, a lot of the allies didn't do it themselves. You know, Churchill didn't exactly speak out um, about some of the things going on. Um, would the Pope's words actually have been listened to? They probably would have caused a lot of um, persecution. They would have probably um, made some of the divisions worse. Um, and certainly what has become clear as well is that behind the scenes, even if he did maintain a public silence, behind the scenes, um, the Pope did a lot to help the victims of Nazism. Um, and he protected and he encouraged the protection of a lot of Jews in the city of Rome. Um, and in fact, the chief rabbi of Rome later became a Catholic and he took as his baptismal name Eugenio, which was the, the first name of Pius XII. So it's, it's, it's not, not a black and white kind of um, issue that there's lots of nuances, lots of complexities. Um, and it's very easy to, with hindsight, isn't it? To always say, oh, if I, it, this is what he should have done. Um, but it was a very, very uh, delicate situation. And now coming to modern times, I'm sure you recognize all these popes on the screen. Um, at the bottom left, St. John the 23rd, who uh, called the Second Vatican Council, this great council to renew the church, to uh, help it encounter modern times, stressing the role of the, of the laity um, and um, renewing our faith in things like the Bible and Revelation and, and the liturgy. Um, what's and then you've got um, above John the 23rd, you've got Paul the sixth uh, and the future John Paul the first, who, of course, died uh, tragically young. Um, and then, of course, John Paul the um, second, who was an outstanding pope. He made 104 foreign trips uh, all around the world. It's worth mentioning that one thing we see in modern times is how the papacy changes in its style and its uh, the way it, it, it exercises its ministry. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, the Pope was still very much um, a Roman figure. He never left the Vatican. In fact, after the fall of Rome um, as a papal city in 1870, he called himself the prisoner of the Vatican. He refused to recognize the kingdom of Italy. Um, but by the 1960s, the Pope had, had become a truly global figure and somebody who actually traveled around the world to visit the church and to confirm their faith. Paul VI, top left, he's the first pilgrim pope of the modern age. In 1964, he went to the Holy Land, went to Jerusalem, um, and further trips took him to New York, uh, Bogota, 
Uganda and Sydney. Um, and his last trip in 1970 was to the Philippines where he narrowly survived an assassination attempt. Um, so pilgrims no longer had to go to Rome to see the Pope. Um, the successor of St. Peter also came to them. And John Paul II, as I said, he made 104 trips, um, including one to England in 1982. Um, of particular importance was his visit to Poland in 1979, which allowed him to encourage the Polish people in their struggle with communism, and it led to the solidarity movement. Um, he also was a, a very ecumenical figure. He um, sought dialogue with other churches, and I'm sure some of you remember those that very moving scene when he came to Canterbury in 1982, and he knelt alongside the Archbishop of Canterbury in the cathedral at the site of Thomas Becket's martyrdom. And he also reached out to other faiths. Um, so he was the first Pope to visit a synagogue, at least since St. Peter, and he was the first Pope to visit a mosque. He was also very much a teacher. He wrote a whole series of letters addressing key subjects like Jesus Christ, Mary, human suffering, the family, morality, the dignity of human life, and the relationship between faith and reason. Um, he was a former university professor and he had a great love for young people as well. And he um, presided over 10 World Youth Days between 1984 and 2002, during which you could hear the chant from the crowds, John Paul II, we love you. His death in April 2005 is something I'm sure we all remember. It, it showed that the papacy could still very much um, make the, the headlines all over the world. People flocked to Rome. Um, to pay their respects. And in fact, even in this country, the Pope's funeral led to the postponement of the Grand National Race and the wedding of Charles and Camilla. It was considered that important to interrupt national events like that. The papacy is a remarkable institution when you think about it. Um, it survived lots of crises down the ages. It's often adapted itself to new circumstances all the time it's remained true to its basic function which is being the glue that binds the church together and a rock uh, in tricky times especially when there's um, confusion about the faith. Um, as the church expanded and developed so too did the understanding of exactly who the Pope was. The church did not miraculously appear as a prefabricated structure complete with the Vatican with all its offices. The church grew gradually and organically shaped by events and personalities and by the Holy Spirit. The Lord chose Peter as the first leader of the church, the apostle who walked on water but then began to sink, who made the first profession of faith and moments later blundered into error, who denied his master three times. And ever since, Peter, um, weak human beings have occupied the throne of the papacy. Some have been saints, as we've seen, like St. Leo the Great or St. John Paul II. Many have been weak in their struggles with the political powers of the time, or they've been guilty themselves of corruption, of um, making their families richer, even of immorality. Such is the mystery of the church that an uh, institution given to us by God is administered by sinners, by weak clay vessels. And despite the current obsession with celebrity, the importance of the Pope is still very much about the office rather than the person. I think sometimes um, we do become a bit too obsessed with the person of the Pope. You know, um, almost every single thing he says is taken as an infallible statement or as, as you know, breaking news, you know, every little interview or every little detail of his life um, or what he what he has for breakfast, you know. Perhaps that's a, an extreme that we 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 should avoid. Um, but also the other extreme would be to see the Pope as completely irrelevant, and that we shouldn't listen to what he says. We need to find a kind of medium between the two and avoid the the culture of celebrity. And the amazing thing is that even the bad popes have safeguarded the deposit of faith um, entrusted to the Church. Even the bad popes have encouraged, even if it was just by inaction, the mission um, of the church. Um, and I think it's true to say that we need Peter today just as much as those first followers of Christ. 
so I've been speaking for long enough. So um, thanks for listening. I know it's been a 2000 year whistle stop tour, but I hope you, you've seen the kind of broad um, strands of development in this story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Nicholas. I think everyone will join me in giving you a round of applause. You've spoken for about 55 minutes there. <laughs> well done.